I'm using a secondary account for obvious reasons. This event is still ongoing, however I was hoping to seek some advice from you guys, because I honestly have no idea what to do. To begin with, I've always had this feeling that someone was watching me ever since I moved into my family house eight years ago. At first, I thought I had just watched too much ID investigation and that I was being a bit paranoid, but I couldn't help looking over my shoulder when I would walk to school or to my bus stop. When I would walk to school, I was always scared in the mornings when it would be dark during the winter or fall, because where I live is just vast country lands. I live in Canada, and though not much crime happens in my neighborhood, I could just never rid myself of this eerie feeling. Even when I would come home from school, being home alone didn't help. I would triple check my windows and locks, just to make sure everything was locked up. However, in my basement, our garage door would never fully lock since the door hinge was broken and detached from the door, therefore it could never properly close. I always told my dad to fix this door, but because he would always go away for work, he never found the time to do so. Stupidly, I thought nothing bad would happen, since my garage needed a four-digit passcode to get in. On a side note, I just want to let everyone know that you should never, under any circumstances, put your birthday as your passcode for anything. Even if you switch up the date so that the day is first and the month is second, don't do it, because it's pretty obvious. Now my theory is that he knew the passcode to my house, therefore he had free reign for seven years to go through my things. At first, I thought I was being forgetful. Maybe I was the one who misplaced my underwear somewhere. Maybe I was the one who misplaced my favorite top, or maybe my dad accidentally donated it. But I should have known better. During my four years of high school, he never really contacted me. It was when I went to university that things suddenly started to change. Since I lived in the countryside, I decided to go to university an hour away. My dad didn't want me to live on residence because he didn't want to leave the house unattended for long periods of time, so we came to the conclusion that it would be best if I drive to and from school. Now, I would leave for university very early in the morning, at around 6 a.m., and come back at around 6 p.m. at night. I stopped being aware of my surroundings at this time because I would be tired from my 12-hour days. Now that I wasn't walking home alone anymore, everything would be fine. When I would come home from university, I would find certain things moved in my house. I'm a neat freak, and I may have mild OCD, so I like things in a very particular way in my house. Little things like my makeup or candles would be moved. I thought it was odd and would frequently bring it up to my dad but he would just say that it must have been me who was doing it. But it wasn't me. During my second and third year in university, I started to get weird notes in my mailbox. The writing on these notes looked almost childlike, and it would always be written in blue ink. I have those country-style mailboxes at the end of my driveway, where the little red flag goes up whenever we get mail. From my way back from university, I would always check the mail, and sometimes I would find these letters. The letters would never be long. In fact, they would only ever be one to three sentences, and they would contain odd questions like, Where are you? I wonder what you do while you're away from home. How do you find university? It must be tiring driving that long. Did you make new friends? Do you still hang out with your best friend? You dress differently now. Why is that? I miss the scarves you used to wear. You don't close your curtains as much anymore. Why don't you look for me? These letters would always come once a month at the beginning of the month. 
I would show my dad, and at first he would say, Oh, maybe our cousins are just pranking you, or it's probably your friends. But every time I would ask my friends or cousins, they would give me this confused response, saying they never sent me any letters. Now that I'm in my fourth year at university, the letters don't come as frequently. But two weeks ago, something happened that makes me think things are escalating. I came back home from university at 7.45 p.m., and it was fairly dark outside. I saw that my mailbox flag was up, so I checked the mail, and it was mostly just bills. At this point, I haven't gotten a note for a little over three months now, so I'm thinking maybe the notes won't come anymore. As I settle in for bed, I change into my pajamas and check the locks as usual. As I checked my front door lock, I looked out the glass panel of my door, and I saw that the red flag of my mailbox is up again. It's 10.30 at night. No way the mail could have gotten dropped off, and plus I had just checked it. I call my dad and tell him about it, and he said not to freak out, that maybe one of our neighbors accidentally got some of our mail and just dropped it off since this happens frequently. I stay on the phone with my dad as I quickly run down my driveway to check the mailbox. As I open the mailbox, I feel my heart drop because it's an unmarked manila envelope. I quickly run back inside and open the manila envelope, and although there's no written note, I find something more disturbing. It's a pair of my old blue panties that I haven't seen in years. At this point I scream and my dad tells me to hang up and call my aunt, who's a police officer. My aunt comes over and checks the inside and outside of my house, but she can't find anything. She tries to jog my memory and asks if I know anyone who could be doing this, but I honestly have no clue. My aunt told me to keep any more letters I get, and she's been staying with me the days my dad is out for work. My dad is thinking about installing security cameras, and hopefully we can catch whoever it is that way. But what else can I do? I'm paranoid because I don't know who this person is, but I know he's been stalking me for a long time. Those panties he sent me were ones I had while I was in high school, and I lost that pair while I was in grade 10. The fear of the unknown is getting to me so much that my anxiety is not letting me function normally. I just don't know what to do. Back in 2013, I was living with my ex at the time, who lived there in a nice country village, and as I was in between jobs at the time, I picked up a job at a local garden center. It was casual retail work, and fairly decent pay and easy going enough that I could take coffee breaks frequently, and wear basically whatever I liked as long as I wore my work polo shirt. It was walking distance from my ex's house and full of people of all ages who were the most lovely people I had ever met. Most of the regular customers who came to the garden center were sweet old people who would visit the cafe because we had free teas and discounted lunches for OAPs if they had a store card. You often got to know every single one of them, and some of them we even gave nicknames. Most of them sweet, like pink-haired lady, a badass 80-year-old grandma who wore a tasseled leather jacket and bright pink hair. Then there was camper van couple who used to drive in a really cool camper van with bright orange flowers painted on it. You get the idea. With creepy artist man though, he gave most of the young girls weird vibes. He wore a straw hat, was in his late 40s and had round gold rimmed glasses. He would wear strange graphic shirts with naked women on them were professional pussy patrol sort of slogans in the back. He always wore ripped jeans where his knees were always hanging out of them, which were always dirty with paint or mud or something. He had this weird half smile that would never leave his face, and a kind of leer that made people feel uncomfortable. He would take off his glasses and clean them constantly, which kind of made you feel like he was trying to get a better look at the girls who worked there, especially the younger ones. 16-plus school leavers, usually. 
Anyway, it was a roasting hot summer's day, and I had gratefully accepted the job of watering the hanging baskets outside, where I could avoid the humid, sweaty heat of the greenhouses. I was wearing black shorts and my red polo, and my tool belt to prune and deadhead plants as well. With the homes in my hand and sunnies on my face, I was busy, but enjoying the solitary job at the quietest part of the garden center. Well, hello there. Out of practically nowhere, he slipped out behind some wooden trellises and looked me up and down, smiling with his weird, too small teeth. His eyes lingered on me for what felt like an uncomfortable few seconds, and I turned off my hose and asked him if he needed anything. He shook his head and kind of shrugged, still smirking at my legs. I'll call him C.A.G. for ease. Okay, sir. Have a nice day. Let me know if you need anything. I turned to continue. I've never seen you here before. You're a new one? Huh? Me? I've been here for eight months now. I must have missed the memo that a beauty like you started. You have a nice tan. You look young. Uh, thanks. I'm 23. Anyways, I have to get back to work. Nice to meet you. I suddenly remember my name badge, and get irritated that he now knew my full name. I make a beeline for the smoking area, where the tool shed was with an excuse to grab some smaller gardening gloves, and by the time I returned to the floor, he had left. As the weeks went by, he would come into the store regularly, usually mid-afternoon, coincidentally, or so I thought, around the time I started my shift. Most of the time, I was the only cashier, so I would have to serve him. He would buy the smallest, most pointless things, like floristry wire or a tiny bag of birdseed. It seemed like he would purposely make a purchase with the intention of interacting with me. He would make comments about my appearance. Statements mostly like, you have your hair different today, yesterday you had it down, or you have new glasses, or that's a different lip color to yesterday. He would always announce my name very loudly and deliberately during every interaction. It felt uncomfortable, but I was 23, and just politely shrugged it off. Around Christmas time, I was decorating the artificial trees and he cornered me in the forest of them at the back of the store. He jumped out from behind one, and made me jump, to which I was kind of pissed about him doing so, because I dropped a glass ornament and it had smashed. He bent down also and tried to help, grabbing my wrist and telling me not to touch the glass. His grip was scarily tight and forceful, and his hands were clammy and gross. I slipped my hand out of his grip, and asked if I could help him with anything. That's when it got weird. He pulled out a leaflet from his back pocket and told me that he was an artist and had a Christmas art show happening in the local church hall. He wanted me to go with him. He told me that he was a painter, and he thought I would like his work. I had never indicated I was interested in art to him or anyone else for that matter, which is why I thought this was so strange. I asked him if he wanted me to pin the leaflet to the local event board and he reached out and touched my arm and said, No, this invitation is specifically for you. He pointed his finger and jabbed it into my breast, and he said, You. I'm standing there in a dark corner, obscured from view by artificial Christmas trees just kind of cornered by this guy who was touching me. I cringed away and said, I was busy with my boyfriend that day, sorry, and kind of scampered off. I remember feeling really strange after that. The fact he grabbed my wrist and jabbed his finger into my chest that way. I told a few of my colleagues about it, and they all told me they would warn me next time he was in the store, so I could maybe hang out at the storeroom until he was gone. Well, that memo must have been missed by a few of the temp Christmas staff, because one day I get told by one, your friend is asking for you at the tales. It wasn't unusual for my friends to stop by, as it was fairly popular for gifts and the like, so thinking it was maybe my ex's mum or something, I head to the till, and there he is. He's holding a piece of paper. I cringe, but he had seen me now, so I walk over and ask what he needed from me. 
He passed the paper over and asked me to open it. Folded up was a drawing of me, with exaggerated breasts and cartoon-like eyes watering the hanging baskets with a sexual kind of position. I stood there and said thank you, but I couldn't keep it, as I thought it was inappropriate to take gifts from customers. I handed it back to him, and he looked at me with an angry stare. He turned around and walked out without another word. By this point I had had enough. I knocked on my manager's door and told him about the whole scenario that just happened. All the previous interactions I had had with him over the past year. He watched the CCTV and agreed that it was so strange. The way he gave me the gross picture and told me he would talk to him if he came back. He praised me for my reaction to his advances and said I was doing the right thing and he would try to see him off the next time. The next day was a Sunday and I was not due in to work. My boss calls me and tells me he just received a call from HQ, stating that an anonymous caller had called in to report a staff member inappropriately coming on to a customer. The staff member they had described and named was me. The caller had said that I had been inappropriate towards him at work, offered to have sex with him and had let him on, and was obviously promiscuous, that I had been pursuing him for over a year. The jerk even described a fictitious relationship we had had, and ranted loudly about how I had been cheating on my boyfriend before hanging up. HQ luckily didn't believe a word, as my manager had already mentioned the guy to one of the higher-ups, but they thought it was wise to let me know about this crazy guy, and suggested I reported it to police. The next day, I did just that. The officer I spoke to said he matched the description of a man who was a local pest, Somebody would often harass young girls in the local area. He was also known to stalk young girls in his car, and had attempted to abduct one four years ago. Police officers assured me they would file the report and talk to him officially, and that he was not allowed to be in the garden center or anywhere near me again. If he did, I was to call the police, and he would be immediately arrested. Unfortunately, though, it never stopped him from sending a ranting letter to my workplace addressed to me saying he would kill himself if I didn't take him back, and received his gift he drew of me. Fortunately, the police took this as unsolicited contact, and he was thankfully immediately arrested. This all happened yesterday, and I'm writing this on my phone from our hotel room, so please forgive my grammatical errors. Here we go. Fort Bragg, California is a small beach town northwest of Sacramento. It has a kind of Stephen King vibe to it. You know what I mean. That misty, almost eerie, small harbor town. But it's beautiful, and a huge tourist attraction. You get people from all over the U.S. that travel here. My fiancé and I decided to drive up here after I had to take some time off work due to stress. It was a last-minute decision, and we packed up our bags in less than ten minutes, grabbed our dog, and took off. If we wouldn't have had our dog with us, I'm pretty sure I would have lost her. I guess this is where I tell the story, right? It's our second day here right now, and we're staying in a motel that overlooks the ocean. You can see the fog roll in during the early hours of the morning and watch the fishing boats leave the harbor to go get their haul for the day. It really is a beautiful thing to see. I woke up early, and I was craving, and I mean craving, eggs and bacon. After getting dressed and deciding what spot to stuff our faces at, we left on our morning adventure. See, here's where I made my mistake. I was driving down the road, and it looked like the stop we crawled up to was a four-way stop sign. I clearly guessed wrong, because when I pulled out and cut off a small Ford Ranger with a dinky trailer attached to it and two old men driving, I realized I was a little too late and that I had cut them off. They threw up their hands and pointed at me, but Lily didn't even notice. I threw up my hands in a sorry I'm just a dipshit tourist kind of way, and they just stared me down. It was a hillbilly standoff that George Strait would be proud of. I didn't think much of it, 
and kept driving down the foggy two-lane road to get breakfast. I didn't even say anything to her about it. I never thought I'd see them again, and I didn't want her to complain about me not knowing how to drive. I was wrong, though. I was wrong, and I'll never forget what happened next. We got back to the motel after a not-so-great but overly expensive breakfast. We cuddled up and talked about our plans for the wedding, what we wanted to do after the wedding, and midway through our life plan, she realized that we were out of dog food to feed Bruce. I agreed to going up to the cute but creepy market and grabbing a bag of goodies, kissed her on the cheek, and jumped in the navy. We call our navigator Navi. I left and got about halfway to the store before I realized that I had forgotten my wallet on the nightstand. When I pulled back into the parking lot, I saw it. That same Ford Ranger with the janky trailer attached to it. The only difference was that Hank and Boomhauer weren't inside of it. I don't remember seeing them here last night, I thought. I walked up to our door while looking over my shoulder, wondering, what are the chances these douchebags are staying here? Not two seconds later, my heart started to beat faster. Our motel door was open, but barely cracked. It was open slightly to the point where you could see a sliver of light, but nothing more. I pushed it open and looked inside, but I didn't see anything. Lily and Bruce were both gone. It was like they were never really there at all. My heart started racing, and I dropped my keys on the floor and ran outside heart pounding in my chest faster than a jackhammer in New York. I didn't see the creepy old guys from the Ford truck or my fiancé outside. I was becoming angry and frantic by this point. Fuck. Fuck, where are you guys? I thought, before screaming inside my head was cut off by the sound of familiar barking. I heard Bruce barking and I ran. I ran faster than I ever have in my 28 years of life. I ran straight over to the front office where the sound was coming from, and that's when I saw her and our dog inside the office. She was crying, sitting on the floor sobbing uncontrollably, and his hair was standing straight up until he saw that it was me sprinting towards them. Lily got up and ran into my arms. Meanwhile, the clerk is on the phone, and I'm wondering, what the hell happened in the two minutes I was gone? This is what happened, told by her and it makes my blood run cold. As soon as I left, not 30 seconds went by when those guys knocked on the door. Lily opened it up thinking it was me forgetting something, which I had, and they tried to force their way into the room. One of them said, You can thank your boy toy for what's coming to you, while grabbing her and covering her mouth. But these assholes didn't realize one thing. That's that we had a dog in our back seat when I cut them off. Bruce jumped off the bed and didn't hesitate to bite the one grabbing her. They kicked at him and tried to shake him off, but he wouldn't let go. After being bit and realizing that the noise would draw attention if they didn't leave, they ran off and Lee was able to run to the front office and wait for help. Bruce followed suit. I wasn't there. I couldn't protect her. If we would have found a dog sitter, she could be gone right now. But my dog was there, and he did exactly what a good boy, no, the best boy, would do. And for that, he is truly my best friend. If he wasn't there, what would have happened? Would she have been kidnapped? Beaten? Killed? The craziest thing is that they haven't been caught yet. We filed all the reports with the local sheriff. I told them what had happened earlier that morning. And the cop looked right at me and said, You're lucky your dog was there. If he wasn't, and they got in there with her, we could have been filing a different report right now. I got tears in my eyes at that. I looked over at Lily and Bruce, and thanked God that I rescued him from the pound, because in return he rescued the love of my life when I couldn't. The only information we had from the sheriff after about a week is that the truck was not owned by the people that committed the crime. Also, after going down to the sheriff's station, we couldn't identify the man they arrested. They didn't look anything like the two guys I had seen and that Lily had come in contact with. Right now, they're out there, somewhere, 
hiding or acting like nothing happened. We're back home in Sacramento, and Bruce as well as Lily are both safe. If I hear anything else, I'll update you all again.